Today we are celebrating Catechetical Sunday. We're moving up a week because we wanted uh, to celebrate it during the corn roast. And so I thought in honor of Catechetical Sunday, which we'll be doing a blessing for the catechist after the Mass, that I would go ahead and do a little deeper dive into, into the homily. So based off of scriptures and stuff, unfortunately it seems... I'm trying to improv a little bit right now because my homily is not up here. So you're going to get Father Carlson unplugged for one second. But uh, Terry, if you can give me that green book right there. I got this homily memorized. Nope, the other one. No, no, no. There's the missile. Nope, that one. Yep, thank you. One out, of three. one out of three is not bad. That's a great batting average. All right, here we go. Let's see how well that's homily memorized, huh? Preaching without notes. That's what I usually do anyway. So... We look at our gospel today, and we see it comes from Matthew 18. Now, this is different than last week, because last week, of course, we are at Matthew 16, and this is where Jesus rebuked Peter. So we skip two chapters, which is very important to realize, because in skipping these two chapters, we actually skipped a great parable right before Matthew 18, verse 15 through 20, which is today's gospel. And this parable, of course, the one right before, is the parable of the lost sheep. Now I bring this up because the lost sheep parable is all about going off and finding those who have fallen away from the faith. And in doing this, there is great celebration when they come back to join us in the faith. We could say joining us back in the church. So then we skip forward to Matthew 18, 15 through 20, and Jesus does a whole discourse on fraternal correction. Now, I don't know about you, but of all the spiritual works of mercy, the hardest one for me to do, and the hardest one for me for sure to receive, is fraternal correction. I don't always do the best at receiving fraternal correction. Usually what happens when someone points out a wrongdoing is my, my ears get very, very red. If you ever see my ears getting very red, you know what's happening inside of me. I'm like almost about to explode. But after receiving fraternal correction... I'm very, very grateful because they've laid out in front of me or opened up in front of me, hopefully, a fault that I did not see. Of course, this makes sense of the Gospels of fraternal correction because both, our, both of our first reading and our second reading speak of this. Our first reading from Ezekiel says, We are called to be watchmen. And if you see a brother or sister sin, you are called to call them out on that. Of course, our second reading from the, prophet, from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans goes on to say, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to their neighbor, hence love is the fulfillment of the law. And it's in the law that actually fraternal correction comes about. Because in the law, we know we shall not commit adultery, we shall not covet, we shall not kill, and all these things. And so when we see one of our brothers or sisters doing this, and by the way, when I mean brother or sister, I don't mean just family brother or sister, but one of our brothers and sisters in Christ do this, we are called to tell them about it. Now this does not mean that we go to every last person we see students in their wrong and say, you know you're doing something wrong, right? That's not what it's called. Instead, we have this relationship hopefully set up with people who we are full of love for them, a true love and we only want the best for them. I remember a teacher in the seminary said, you're only going to have two or three real friends in your life. And I questioned him on that. I said, what do you mean only two or three of your friends? And he says, a real friend can have a good time with you. But they can also tell you when you're in the wrong, when you're acting in an inappropriate way, when you're drinking too much, when you're not being respectful. That's who a true friend is because they're looking out the, for the best interest of you. Hopefully, by the way, if you're married, you guys have this type of relationship. Not that we're calling out every last thing they've done wrong, please don't do that, but instead trying to help the person grow closer to God. So as we look closer at Matthew 18, we see the first verse, Matthew 18, 15, it says, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, if we, if, we, if we look at the Greek word of tell, by the way, it means to lay open, to uncover the fault. 
And this is not meant to be harsh to the person. It's not meant to rebuke the person. It's not meant to have revenge. I can't believe what you did to me. It made me feel this way. No, no, no. What Jesus is saying in fraternal correction is we lay it open before them out of love so that maybe they can see the area in their life that they need to improve, especially if it's a grave sin. I love the second part of this verse as well. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Did you catch that? We don't hop on the phone. We don't start texting. We don't start Snapchatting. So-and-so did this to me. Da -da 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 -da. That's not what we do. Instead, it's between our brother or sister, our friend, and me alone. Our desire is not to slander them, but to help them. Now, in the second verse of this gospel, verse 16, as if, if he refuses to listen, then go and get two or three witnesses along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And why do we do this? Well, if he still or she still refuses to listen, we want to point out how severe, how severe this sin is, how it's affecting not only me, but the community as well. And the hope here, once again, is not to embarrass the person, as Jesus is saying. The hope is that, that they may come together and they may repent of their ways and come back into the fold, just like the lost sheep. Now, verse 17 brings the church into it as well. If they refuse to listen to them, tell the church. And why do we do this? It's because now it's affecting the whole community. And the church, as we know, has authority, as we're going to hear in a little bit, to loose and to bond certain sins. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. And the church, when this happens, by the way, sometimes it's that excommunication. But even then, the desire is always what? For them to come back. It's not to ostracize them, but rather to welcome them back in and to say, this is how severe this sin is. But we want you to change your ways here, on the, here in the world, on earth, so you can be with us where? In heaven. This is the beginning of Matthew 18, actually. Jesus speaking about the kingdom of heaven. And if there's lost sheep, if we have brothers or sisters who are in error, we're called to help them out. Jesus goes on to say, Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This, of course, is the same verse we hear in Matthew 16 when it comes to Peter. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But now Jesus is giving the authority to the apostles as well. Not just Peter, but the apostles. Now, my favorite verse in this whole gospel, by the way, because the most important part of fraternal correction comes from Matthew 18, verse 19. Amen, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for what they are to pray, it should be granted to them by my heavenly Father. If two of you agree about anything on earth but what you should pray, it should be granted to them by my heavenly Father. So the most important part of fraternal correction is prayer. Is prayer. We come before the Lord and we pray. And we say, Lord, help me to act in charity to my friend who is in sin. Help me to love them and to lay open before them their errors. Not to rebuke them, but to show them that they need to repent so they may be closer to you. Not healing our relationship, but your relationship with them. Fraternal correction always must be based in charity and always must be based in prayer. Verse 20 goes on to say, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So two or three come together now. Our brother, our sister has repented of their ways and we are together in Jesus' name and Jesus is with us. Of course, this calls to mind Matthew chapter 1, Emmanuel, God is with us. And this is what Jesus is saying. Whoever's gathered in my name, 
It was in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy that would say, who's ever gathered in, in the name or around the Torah, God will be present. But now Jesus is saying, who's ever gathered together in my name, coming together, I am present amongst you. Isn't that what we desire? To be together with God? Not only here on earth, but in heaven as well? You know, there's a reason that God gave us fellow brothers and sisters to live with. We're not just individuals. We're here as a community. Because we're meant to help each other out. And so we ask for fortitude and courage to give fraternal correction out of love for those people who are very, very close to us. Once again, not pointing out just their their faults that we see because it's annoying to us, but if it's an evil, if it's a sin, we must call this out for those whom we love. And more importantly, we ask God to give us the courage and grace to receive fraternal correction, especially if it's given in charity, knowing that our friend is doing it out of love, not out of evil, not out of anger, not out of revenge. We receive it out of love and we gather together then, repent of our ways, gather together in God's name, and he truly will be with us.